Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ryan Lathan, the manager of marketing and communications at Fort Worth Opera. Welcome to Metropolitan Opera star Jennifer Rowley's latest Zoom masterclass, Competing at the Highest Level. On behalf of everyone at FWO, we are so thrilled and super honored to have beloved artist manager Ken Benson of Ken Benson Artists and Yay! graduate student career consultant for the Juilliard School with us this afternoon. Woo! Yay! Yay! For over two decades, Mr. Benson headed his own division as Vice President at Columbia Artists Management Incorporated, and he has continued to develop and polish and build the careers of some of the opera world's greatest performers and stage directors. He regularly serves as an adjudicator for some of the most prestigious vocal competitions in the country, and he is a highly sought after lecturer, interviewer, and writer on all things opera, as well as a panelist and host of the Metropolitan Opera broadcast. Thank you so much, Mr. Benson, for being here today. We are yes, so happy Yes, thank you're you here. so much. My pleasure, Jennifer. and please call me Ken, everybody. Okay, Ken, thank sorry. You. <laughs> thank you, Ken. Thank you, Jennifer. Congrats to all of our uh, wonderful singers today, and I pass the baton over to you. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, we're so happy to have Ken with us this week for a class that is going to be all about the competition circuit. So everything that you're going to see today is going to be related to auditioning for those competitions so we can win some money and we can keep developing our careers. Because I have to tell you, the competitions for me, they really were instrumental in what I was able to do to develop my career as I was coming up in the business and really heading into that emerging professional and professional world. Those competitions, they kept me studying. They kept me singing. They kept me in my voice lessons. They kept me in coachings. They afforded me audition trips in America as well as overseas. They, you know, there's so much that they helped me with. So the competition circuit in America as well as in Europe, it's so important for every young singer, not only because you get exposed to so many people in the business through them, but also because they're the, the, the winnings and, and the prizes are so incredibly helpful for you in the development of your young careers. So I'm so happy that we could do a whole class focusing on the competition and who better to have than the man who literally is on every competition panel in New York City, but Ken Benson. So thank you, Ken, so much for being here with us today. It's, it's absolutely my pleasure. I was thrilled that you invited me. And I, I said to Jennifer, I was especially thrilled because in a way we went through the process together. I, I had <laughs> the competitions off and on, but about Eight or 10 years ago is when I really started doing them a lot. And it was the period that Jennifer was coming up and doing well. So I really feel like we shared that experience across the table, which is- We great. did. <laughs> we really did, didn't we? And it's been, it's been so rewarding to see the way your career has developed. And that was, that was actually a really great period. An incredible number of singers from that period are yeah. making important careers. So that's, that's yeah. really gratifying. But- you know, I, I love singers, I love repertoire, and it, it seems sort of a natural fit. I, I completely agree with, with what Jennifer said. When I first started doing competitions, I thought, well, this is about getting some extra money and every singer can use extra money, and that's true. But in a way, the, the exposure and the networking and the connections you make are almost even more important because yeah. I know some singers who maybe did not win a big prize, but they got an engagement out of it. And that, Absolutely. that in the long run is even, is even more important. It's just building that foundation and, and building on and people hearing you more than once. And it's such, it's such an interesting process. So anyway, Absolutely. I'll, I'll, so I'll let's, let you direct that. No, no, Ken, let's talk a little bit about that process because when I was doing competitions and I did a lot of them between like when I was 30 to 32 is when I really did the bulk of my competitions. Um, I just wasn't quite ready to do them until that age. So um, I really did all of them kind of in a two or three year block of time. And I always felt like the competition audition was a different animal than the young artist audition or even the main stage audition. And I felt like 
there was such a strategy involved with building the repertoire list. And we've talked so much with the different people that we've had as guests on our series here about those five contrasting arias at every level and what contrasting means at every level and how it changes. So could you talk to us a little bit about how the audition for the competition circuit is different than say a regular young artist or main stage audition and how the repertoire list changes for the competition versus say a young artist program audition or a main stage audition? Yeah, I'm happy to. I think that's a good point. I think when you're singing for um, a main stage audition, you're generally singing for specific repertoire or a role. Mm -hmm. So I think you want to focus what you present at that audition as closely as possible to the, to the opera you're going after, either the role or something similar in style. Uh, a young artist audition, you probably have very specific requirements as far as, you know, what languages they want to hear, what their repertoire may be that summer. So for the for the young artist, when you'll have less leeway, the, the deal there, I think, is more to, to follow the requirements. But I think a competition one, I, I often say to a singer, think of your arias for a competition as if someone hired you to sing an opera gala. What mm -hmm. are your special pieces? And by that, I don't necessarily mean only the longest or the highest or the fastest. They can actually be something quite simple and beautiful as long as it's very you. In, in other mm -hmm. words, not that you just are supposed to sing this because of your voice category, but that, that it really plays to your particular strengths. I think it's important that a singer does, does have a sense of what their particular strengths are. And you made a great point, uh, Jennifer, about not doing these too early because I think a lot of singers almost think of competitions as the next step coming right out of school. Which and they're not. 20s, and they're not, they're no. not. Because competitions require a degree of confidence, of poise, um, and knowing yourself. And, and you're probably yes. not gonna have that at, at, in your early 20s. So I, I think it's very much, think of a competition as when you're really stepping into the professional career, like the young mm -hmm. professional. But, but obviously, um, I mean, it, it helps to have variety, but I don't think we need to spread ourselves too thin. I don't, I'm not a big fan of the five arias have to be in five languages and five styles. Agree, agree, agree. <laughs> none of us does five things equally well as a singer right. in life. We all have right. things we do better. And I think it's important to know what those are and say, and, and you know what, it is trial and error. During that period that I was judging lots of competitions early on, I could see a lot of young singers coming in and trying different things on, like trying different hats or something. And it was so interesting for them to, to see what they discarded and what they kept and built on, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's also really important to find areas that work together, you know, in conjunction. Yes. In other words, if you're going to sing this, can you sing that afterwards? Do you need to sing that particular aria first? I remember the most dramatic example I heard of that was an incredibly young baritone who's having a big career today. And he came in and sang uh, Tomsky's ballad from Pete Dom, and he sang the hell out of it and performed wow. it. it was just thrilling. And wow. he had not even, the, the piano and his vocal cords were still vibrating. And one of my <laughs> fellow judges said, can we hear the second verse of Wolfram, the Evening Star, please, which is all legato and piano. Right. And he, thought he was in complete overdrive. He couldn't do it. Right. And I said to my colleague, that was kind of mean. And she said, yeah, but it's on his list. Ah. But you know what? You know what? He never did that again. I mean, you no, learn, I'm sure not. <laughs> you, learn, you learn from experience. I mean, there is that game on 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 our side of the table. Whatever the list shows, try to find. We'll try to find as big a contrast as possible. Mm -hmm. We will probably. You could be asked to do things in a competition audition that no composer would ever ask you to do in one role. For sure. Which is, so it's not it's not realistic. But I think I think. Give, give some variety, but find what you do best. If you can get rid of the should arias on your list and get to the point where you love every one of them, yes, that's, to me, that's half the battle. If you can walk into a room and not worry about what people are going to ask for, that you're halfway home already. Because if Absolutely. you have something there that you hope they don't ask for, guess what? That's exactly that's what's going to happen. <laughs> We've been talking about it, that a lot. 
We've been talking about that a lot on every class that you can't, you can't play that guessing game of if I do this, then they're going to pick this. No, Scott oh. Guzliak told us, don't do my job for me, which I thought was so great. Right. And it's really true. You can't, you can't play that game. You have to just go in with five arias that are polished, perfected, coached to within an inch of their life that you love and that you feel super confident with each one of them. So that way, if the panel picks any one of the other four or five arias dependent upon the competition, you're like, oh, I'm going to have a perfect audition with all of them. Yeah, right. nothing on the list that you're like, oh, God, I hate this. No, why would you want to sing that? You wouldn't I do was... that in life. You wouldn't do that in your career. If you really hate something, you're not going to program that in your season. You're not going to take that job. So don't put that on your list. Yeah, Ken, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I was you, just going to say, I always <laughs> it's think so important. the five arias is like you've got five arrows to shoot at the target and you want <laughs> everyone to have a chance of really hitting the bullseye. Not, Absolutely. You know, I mean, there's always, there's always the tenor who is a natural Puccini Verdi tenor and everybody loves that, but he feels obligated to have Tamino or something on his list because, you know, and you know what? That's what they'll ask for. And I'd rather yeah. hear someone sing three Puccini arias really well it yes, would, I'd say that's who that singer is. That's what they're about. Absolutely. So in thinking about the ARIA package and the five to six that any competition generally asks for, how do we pick that one special ARIA that becomes the starter ARIA? And for most people, it's the starter ARIA for the season of competition. Um, I mean, we know, you know, when Angela Mead was winning her series of competitions, she sang Casta Diva at every competition. Right. And that girl sang the hell out of Casta Diva. And that's why she won everything, you know? And when I was doing competitions, I had my one aria that I went into every competition and I was like, I got it, right? So how do we pick that one special piece? Is there, is there a length issue that we need to think about? Um, it, is there anything like really important that we need to have in that very first aria that really tells the panel everything they need to know in that first five minutes and then can sort of lead our audition from there? Well, I think uh, the, the first thing I'll say is you, you have to go in thinking that if you really only sing one aria, if it's later in the day or something, you get to sing one aria, you have to feel at peace with that. You have to mm -hmm. say, okay, I only did one, but that's the one that I, I'm happy with. I think something that really immediately shows the color and the sweet part of your voice, that, because there's this really strange, it's first impression that, that bypasses the brain. Um, one of my colleagues who judged competitions for years said, you know, we're all here because we have expertise on some level, mm -hmm. but we still have an emotional response first to a voice. She said, we're sitting here, that voice will enter five pairs of ears here. We'll then process it in our hearts, in our gut, and different results are gonna come out. After that emotional response, then we start thinking about language and intonation and rhythm and, and but it's, it's almost an immediate gut emotional reaction first. So what, what, what do you want? What, either what part of your voice, what emotionally do you want to express almost immediately? You know, mm -hmm. you need to engage people. Unfortunately, people make the first impression very quickly. Then yes. other impressions come along. But that first reaction to a voice is still very primal almost, you know? So mm -hmm. I, th I think you want to find something that you really, and, and that, again, that doesn't come easily. I mean, that for a young singer, you want to try a lot of things or you're learning something new and it's like having a new toy. So it, <laughs> is, it, is, it is trial and error. I mean, in a way, Jennifer, you're asking about length. There is a theory that a short aria is good because chances are better that someone will hear you sing something else. But when Jennifer, I don't know if we're thinking of the same aria, but for me, the aria that really got in the groove for Jennifer was the aria from Verdi's Il Corsato. Mm -hmm. is not short, but Jennifer did it so persuasively and so committedly that it, it totally worked. And people stop thinking about length. That's the trick is if you have a lone aria, do it in such a compelling way. Tell a story, engage people. I always say to singers, by the time you walk into a competition, 
you don't have time for one more voice lesson or coaching. Yep. You are where you are. You may as well go in and deliver the goods and be happy about what you do. Don't try to second guess anybody. Don't say, oh, I heard she likes big voices or he likes this. That's right. It is what it is. And, and you know what? It's, it's such a personal response that if you go in and do the best you that you can, that's all you can ask for. And people Absolutely. either get it or not get it. And you can't control that. I I love that. And I think that's amazing. I have a couple of questions popping up here in the chat and I think they're valid. How, uh, how important in that first aria, uh, someone's asking it are the fireworks, the coloratura, the high notes in that first aria. And also how important that is it that it's in your fach right now versus maybe five years from now, something that's maybe more of a reacher. Uh, as far as the competition circuit is concerned. Because when I was coming in, I always had the one reacher. I always had the one aria that was just a little bigger than what I'd get hired to sing right now. But I knew in five years, that was something I was going to sing. So maybe at that point, I wasn't going to get cast at any regional house for that particular role. But I would take it to a competition because it is definitely something that I can do in my voice. And in five years, I definitely saw myself going in that direction. So how important are those those fireworks and that reacher aria or something that's a little bit bigger or how, how much importance does the panel take it takes those sort of things? How how much importance do they do they place on that? Well I always I always feel I mean if a voice moves, I really to me that's an incredible asset. Not just yes. for Picanto, but for early Verdi and almost all music in French repertoire. So I'd like to know that a voice moves. Um, the tricky thing is that sometimes those firework arias can be the long ones. They can be, yes. you know, cavatina, cabaletta kind of thing. Again, it, I'm sure you've all figured this out hearing from different people. We, everything, we all have, this is a strong business of, prof of opinions. We all have strong opinions. <laughs> so today is my opinion. Today is thinking yes. As my two cents. I, I saw a great masterclass years ago by Renato Scotto, and at the beginning she said, keep what you like, throw the rest away. And I thought, you know, amen. That's a really good way to put it. So if Absolutely. You get out of amen. <laughs> if, if, if someone sings a slower aria and they have something with fireworks of any voice type, not just soprano, but of any voice type, I will really push to hear the movement and the fireworks. To me, it is mm -hmm. such an important part of singing and I like it, that if a voice moves, I'd like to know it. So mm -hmm. chances are, if it's, be, so be prepared. What happens a lot in arias is people may start with something more lyrical and be asked to sing just the cabaletta or even a verse right. of the cabaletta. So if you're getting into that repertoire, be prepared to offer excerpts. You know, it's, right. it's tricky. If you go in with your cavatina, cabaletta, that may be the only thing you sing. But then right. people have heard a wide variety of stuff. If right. not, I personally would really want to hear about the fireworks. If your voice doesn't move brilliantly, don't worry about it. I mean, just work on it in the studio, but right. don't feel compelled to offer it. But so I don't know if that offered the thing, but I, to me, absolutely, I, I would say movement is very important in a voice if if the singer has it. Yeah, as absolutely. far as the as far as the the stretch repertoire, I think competitions. It's another way competitions are different. Uh, if you're going to sing for Tosca in a regional theater. Visi Dante is actually not fully representative of much of the rest of Tosca. So yes. there are many sopranos early on who could sing Visi Dante, but could not yes. sing the whole role. Yes. I would not go into a house audition unless you're prepared to sing the complete role by the time of engagement, you know? Right. However, I agree with you. I agree with what you said about a competition because there are many roles that have an aria that is not typical, but is a gem. It's just beautiful and you can sing it well now. I right. would think that in a competition setting, that stretch aria, people would take that in the right context. You're not singing yes. for Tosca at this point, but if you sing a gorgeous Vichy Dante, then that can be a real asset. So Absolutely. that's my feeling on that, is that people would have, they'd understand the context and the difference. So thank you for keeping track of the chat. I've been very negligent. I'm no, not, no, it's I'm fine. Not. You don't have to. We'll, we'll take care of it for you. Okay. <laughs> we just, we all want all your expertise all the time. So you don't one, even One thing, I'm, I'm, happy to, <laughs> I'm happy to answer anything. But one interesting thing is, once you have your five arias that you love, this is an interesting story. I feel like the process is something I was always learning about too there was uh, a tenor who came in and he sang something I've almost never heard, which is the big 
uh, tenor mad scene, Tom Rakel's mad scene from Rick's Progress, very oh. long, which is very long. And it was odd. And he, I remember he was dressed in a nice gray suit. And I, I looked down to make a note. And I looked up and he was on the floor. You know, he was totally into it. And it worked because he was, he was completely invested. So therefore, we were. Mm-hmm. And you know what? He won first prize. And I saw him at a reception afterwards. And I said, you must be the first tenor ever to win a first prize with that aria. He said, I'll tell you something really interesting. When I got on the elevator to go up, I was going to sing Lenski to begin. And I got off the elevator 30 seconds later, knowing I had to sing that Rake's Progress at that moment. And that was really interesting to me. So if you have on the day, once you've got your five at the place that they all feel really good, it's great to have, because we all are different on different days. The weather's Mm -hmm. different, slept differently the night before. We're in a different emotional place. If if you, I, I think if you have a strong gut reaction like that, I would say pay attention to it. I think that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. That's that's fantastic advice. I love that. And you're right. We all are very different, you know, especially women with hormones and things like that. You know, if you if you wake up and you don't have your E flat that day, have a have another option uh, yeah. of something to do that shows you off in a really great way. But maybe we don't need to necessarily throw out the E flat that might not work that day. <laughs> you know, we've all been there. Mm. Um, great. So let's also talk just a little bit about winning the competition and winning the prize and what happens if you don't win, right? Because there are uh, obviously hundreds of singers, if not thousands of singers who apply for these competitions and maybe there are five prizes, right? Or, or, Or three prizes for that matter. And the top three people that the panel liked that day, you know, aesthetically chose that day are the ones who won. But that doesn't negate the work that the other 500 singers had, you know, did over the course of three days. So what would you say to someone who doesn't win? And what are the things that sort of go on behind the scenes that maybe we don't know about for, you know, for example, I, when I started competing, I didn't win at, at first. However, Lenore Rosenberg was on the panels all the time at that point because she was casting at the Met. And so I got my audition for Musetta at the Met from singing in a competition that I did not win. And actually, that was great, <laughs> right? Because yes, then absolutely. I went on to make my debut as Musetta. So talk a little bit about when you don't win, because it's going to happen. When we don't win, it, it's not a reflection on you. It's not a personal really not. reflection. And, and what things, what can happen? What's going on behind the scenes that, that we singers just don't know about? Well, I'll tell you, first, the first part is about yourselves. I think that's why it's important to develop your own standards and your own criteria for how you did. Because, mm-hmm. you know, when you when you walk out of an audition, don't try to please everybody else. Try to please yourself. If you mm-hmm. feel good, that's that's an important signal. Uh, it's great if you can kind of learn something, like some small detail. Try something to do again or not do again. Uh, you know, but you've got to you've got to, you've got to get something out of your audition too, no matter what happens. So I think you've got to have your own standards. Now, as far as the behind the scenes part, you have no idea of how what agonizing conversations i've been in deliberation you know they are agonizing they are (laughs) either in the competition or attending one you know sometimes that deliberation period can go on forever and that's because some people are passionately advocating for a singer that ultimately may not get one of those top three prizes I I always say to singers, I wish you knew just how close you were. And I know everybody wants to win first, second, or third prize. But when you you were an inch from the third or second prize, which is both frustrating, but also uh, an encouragement to keep doing it again. Now, singers don't, they don't know all those nuances. They're not privy to that. But, and, and sometimes, honestly, there are factual things that come into play, like, how does someone's is someone about to age out of a competition say mm-hmm. there's singers that you know there may be some incredibly talented 23 year old 
and if someone is 29 or 30 and the competition has an age limit, in all honesty, sometimes that's factored in. It's like, well, this, it's this person's last chance, mm -hmm. but this person can come back. Mm -hmm. now, is that totally fair to that brilliantly talented 23-year-old? Maybe not. But we, we assume that the older singer is also very talented or they, that we wouldn't be having that conversation. Right. So sometimes, sometimes, you know, every once in a while you get this really young person out of nowhere that blows people away. But I think the feeling is they have more options to come back. So that, right. that's another one of those things. But, but you know, you, again, you can't control a strong advocate because you don't know who you're really going to touch on the panel. Right. But I have I have been there. I've I've both been the advocate and I've I've heard other people truly go to bat and actually almost shift the balance, not through any way other than passionate ad advocating, you know? Mm -hmm. And again, not anything you control other than just go in and impress a couple of people so much by your personal commitment and style and storytelling. Right. And, and when there are, you know, artist managers and casting directors and, you know, conductors and things like it's people like that on the panel, quite often, if somebody really likes you, they're going to give you a job. You know, yes. there, there, there are plenty of casting directors who sit on those panels who have cast people from a competition audition just because they really liked them. Um, yes. And, you know, not necessarily did that person win that competition, but somebody fell in love with them or with their voice or, you know, what they had to give from that presentation. So you just don't know all the things that are going on behind the scenes. And, and I have to tell you guys, I sat on a panel, a competition panel for the Metropolitan Opera National Council audition several years ago for the first time. And I was blown away by being on the other side of the table and the reaction to singers and really like how you react to a certain singer and your advocacy on the panel for that singer. It is really, I mean, it's a crazy reaction. I mean, I, I will just, I'll never forget. We had this 21 year old baritone from the University of Michigan who sang Look Through the Port from Billy Budd. And he was spectacular, spectacular. And he had a moment on stage and, and, and we all got chills. And the, the judging panel, I literally was like, no, we have to give this kid something. He must have something, he has to. And, and the judging panel had said, no, he's, he's way too young. We can't, we can't put him in the situation of going forward possibly and singing with the Met Orchestra in the finals. He's way too young right now but he can come back in, you know, several years. And I was like, but, 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 <laughs> and I, I mean, I really just, I, I really thought this kid had had a moment and they did give him an encouragement award and, and that was wonderful. But it was it, on the other side of the table, you, you would be so surprised what the panel does go through when talking about all of these singers because so many people have so much talent. And, and the panel really does want to help you. They really do want to give you money and, and help you on your journey into your professional career. So, you know, anybody that goes into a competition, know that. Know that you're standing in front of a panel of, you know, three to nine people or whatever that really do want to help you in your career Absolutely. in one way or another. You know, sometimes we go in and we get it in our head, oh, they didn't like me. It, you can't judge them. You, no, you absolutely no. can't. They, they want to help you. They want to be there for you. And they want to listen to you. That's why they're there. They wouldn't have agreed to do it if they, if they didn't want to. So no. with that said, Ken, let's, can we talk a little bit about what you see going forward into 2020? Because we've talked about this on all the classes so far. And, and how you see competitions, especially, you know, there's some that actually do happen in the fall. How are those competitions going to take place? Are they going to take place? Or are we going to see everything sort of moved into the spring? Do you, have any, do you have any thoughts on that? 
I, I think it's a mixture. Just one quick follow-up. I just want to reiterate that anytime yeah. you walk into a room, people don't sit in a room for five days hearing singers unless they love singers. Yes, yes. You know, thank you. Someone said, <laughs> thank you. Someone said to a friend of mine, wow, Ken must be making a fortune. It's competition season. I said, you know what I get? A sandwich. I get a, a sandwich. sandwich. You do. So nobody I'm gets here, paid to sit in that I'm room. I'm here because I love singers. And I have a thing that anytime a singer walks into the room, I push a reset button. No matter what happened previously, I kind of go, okay, reset, new person, give them new energy, new space. Now, going, going forward, I think it's going to be a mix of things. I think it's, it's been announced now that the Met National Council is going to be all virtual because, and I, I, I think, first of all, thank God they're going forward because I think singers need any kind of help they can get right now. Yes. And I think the Met very correctly feels that however they start the process, if it starts virtual, it has to continue virtual until, mm -hmm. until the semifinals. What I've heard from some of the competitions that are New York based is that if they are held normally in the fall, like the Opera Index, yeah, opera they index, are holding out and hoping to reschedule in, in the spring. They, okay. they're, so they're not canceling. They're hoping to just shift it within the same season, but the spring part. They do. Okay. They, they all really want to do it for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's why these foundations exist. There's nothing more frustrating than not giving singers money. But yeah, I I, I have a couple of smaller uh, virtual competitions that I'm going to be judging. We'll see how it works. I mean, I think we've sort of gotten into the since since a lot of um, competitions did video screening or young artist programs did video screening as a first round, we've all gotten a little bit more comfortable with watching them. They're not right. ideal, but I think if everybody's competing in the, competing in the same playing field, but I, think, I right. think we're all now finding out that we have to sort of get up to speed on, on our audition videos as much as mm -hmm. possible. Yes, thank you. We, uh, yeah. we all do. <laughs> yes, all you guys are being all... creative, so therefore we have to be creative. Yes, Because we can't, we, I mean, one of, our, one of the life's blood of our job is presenting new singers in auditions, and we can't do that right now except through recording. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm sure it's something you all think about and talk about all the time, but I think they're assuming an importance. I mean, I think from what I know from my colleagues, uh, you know, the Tucker already had to skip last year, which they felt really badly about. Because yeah, another thing, sad. another thing about the competitions, they're very often tied into like a showcase winners concert, which is very nice. A lot of the winners get a chance to appear in front of an audience. Yes. And that's very often a, a fundraising event for the foundation. So that's another thing they've lost right now are those kinds of events of presenting their winners in a concert. So I, yeah. I, I, right now, nobody is happy about, nobody wants to think they've canceled them. I think they all want to feel that postponing into the, the magical spring, whatever, whatever happens in the spring. Whatever yeah. happens there, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. We, we are right. all, those of us on the other side are raring to go. We are dying to go. So I'm sure, I'm sure. I mean, we're all dying to sing, right, guys? <laughs> we're, I'm so I'm sure everybody's ready to, to get moving and get working. And I'm, I'm so happy that, you know, a competition like the Met has sort of set a precedent and said, okay, we're going to do this online because we need to hear singers and we want to hear singers and we need to keep the singers singing. And I think that that's going to sort of flow through the business into other competitions, into other auditions and things like that, where, you know, if we have to sit on Zoom and have a panel on Zoom and one singer singing, we know we can do it. Yeah. We know we can do it and we know we can continue building careers and moving young artists up through the business. And, and really, I, 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 love, I love that the Met is doing that. I think it's fantastic. And I think it sets an example for everybody else to sort of be like, okay, they're being creative. Let's be creative. Right. So right. with that said, shall we hear some auditions? I feel like it's time. I think um, that's so great. With, again, if yeah. I could just do a postscript and then I'm ready for the first singer. Um, let's do it. When when we come back, we may come back quite quickly. We don't know. I mean, if there mm -hmm. is this incredible vaccine, you know, it's, it feels like forever that we've not been active but we could come back quickly. And that's why I think it's so important that people be in shape and in form. And I think the singers that are most ready to jump right in whenever there's going to be an opening, you know, I don't, I don't yep. think that the opening is going to be as agonizingly long and slow as the shutdown has been. I think it could yeah. happen. So anyway, just want to Thank say you, that. Ken, so, so much. So let's get started with Miss Chloe. Are you there? 
I am. Hi, everyone. Yay. Yeah. Hi. Go ahead, sweetie. Hi, everyone. My name is Chloe San Antonio, and this afternoon I'd like to offer C'est l'Atre from Verter by Massenet.
Very good. I'm gonna just I'm gonna throw it right over to Ken, uh, and okay. I'm gonna ask him uh, as a panelist what he would do next. <laughs> I'm I'm sorry. You, are you asking Chloe what she sings? What she would normally no, no, sing? No, no. We can ask Chloe what she would normally no, sing. No, I'm next. I'm happy to say a few things. Um, yeah, please. I thought it was it was. I, mean, I, I was talking a little bit earlier about something that's going to grab people right away. And I think that for you, this aria does this. On those first Verteres, I, I felt like I was right away hearing the color and core of your voice. You got those out there front and center, which to me was very arresting and grabbed my attention. That's exactly what I was talking about, of grab our attention so, you know, we're pulled in. I, that's that's an aria that's on the longer side, but it's, it's also interesting because it's sectional, it has different moods. So that, that keeps it interesting. And I thought you maintained um, a really good degree of focus and, and intensity throughout. From, from what I heard of both the higher part and the lower part, they both sounded really good. I was not hearing mm -hmm. limitations. Uh, to me, what I would consider a, a really full, full voice, I don't know, we, we get into weird terminology, a full young mezzo, I would call you, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I think you sing at least one thing that moves in if we had lots of time in different situations. This is a situation where I would immediately want to hear the Rossini because that was right. impressive. So that's just my initial reaction. Chloe, can you tell me what, what else is on the list? Because I don't have a list uh, over here. Can oh, you just tell us what, what the yeah. other things on the list would be for us? Um, normally, I would sing Pensa la Patria from L'Italiana. Um, I also have an aria from JFK that I really love singing. It's sort of my like special piece. Mm -hmm. um, and I have, I'm kind of working on the last few. I mean, I've done like Dorabella, but that doesn't quite feel right um, for competition. So I have sort of, the rest of it is in process. In so, process, yeah. yeah. Um, I definitely, I agree with Ken. I would want to hear something that moved. Yeah. Um, I, I really, uh, I love to hear parto parto in an audition. Um, mm -hmm. It shows a lot and it shows also your beautiful color also right away. So mm -hmm. it, it's one of those arias that it, it shows a lot right without having to have the rossini coloratura which is you know sometimes it's quite fast and sometimes we actually don't get the full scope of the voice in that rossini coloratura stuff but parto parto really does do that and i i think that might be um i think that might be something very exciting for you um yeah i i'm sure your jfk piece is is fabulous and it's sure. sad it's always sad to me because some you know unless you start with it sometimes if you're probably not going to get asked for it a lot because we really do i do want to hear the voice move now you know that right. that's really the that's really the thing but you know that jfk piece can be something that you would then put on the gala after you win the competition or win one of the prizes or something right. like that then you can 
you know, put that onto the, onto the gala performance or a concert or something like that, where we feature the winners. Um, right. So I, I think that's, that definitely for sure. Um, what other things are you sort of under consideration for the rest of the list? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm looking at, I just started um, Chenna Rentala. I'm really happy with the Rossini that I do have. And usually I tend to start with it. Okay. Um, I felt like this one, I just did. Yeah. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> but I tend to start with the Rossini. Um, I'm starting working on Chenna Rentala. I think, I'm not sure if I should start erring on the side of like, Adalgisa or I don't know I've touched on Joanna Seymour a little bit um I was no. actually gonna go there um and yeah. Ken I don't know how you feel about this but I, I was actually gonna go into Bel Canto land and I you know I know you from Teatro Nuovo so I know that you can do that yeah. and you know something like Adalgisa's aria or Sara mm -hmm. from Roberto right. Devereaux right. would show me a different kind of coloratura and a different kind of, of ascent up into the top of the voice than, say, the Rossini would. Ken, I don't know how you feel about that, but I'd, I'd like you to can't see my pad, here. but I had Sara and Otto Jesus. So that's, ah, there you that's go. <laughs> there you no, go. I, I <laughs> there you go. <laughs> to me, the general categories would be bel canto, French, and some of the bigger Mozart. I also think parts is a great idea, but to me, Adalgisa can be sung very lyrically. My, mm -hmm. One of my key philosophies in voice is I like to hear repertoire sung fully. I don't mean pushed or big, but I like to hear that solid core. So I want to hear the singer in a, a place where they can still be comfortable enough to fill it out. Not that they're operating at the maximum of their limit. And mm -hmm. I don't think, certainly Adalgisa's entrance aria and prayer would be really beautiful. And you can do all these beautiful colors and dynamics. And I had Sara also. Uh, so that's exactly what I hear. Did you mention Heggy? I didn't quite hear. Did you say a Heggy or? Okay. No, um, if, no. If I I think, the one thing I was gonna suggest, I, I'm not very big on shoulds on a list, but one thing now is that even before the pandemic, 21st century repertoire was becoming really important. That, that yeah. newer operas were flourishing in a way that we had never seen before. Now, when we come back, there's going to be newer, smaller chamber virtual operas. And there's a lot of good stuff for mezzo in that. I thought of Dr. Atomic, Am I in Your Light? Or uh, yeah. Gatsby, yeah. Great Gatsby. I think, I don't want to say it's a should, but I think it would be valuable in addition. But I think, I think the longer line, Bel Canto and the Rossini both would be wonderful. Yeah, I agree mm -hmm. with you. I also was thinking about that flight, the flight aria. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> excuse yeah. me, the one where she's, <coughs> Excuse me, where she's talking about the luggage and whose yeah. luggage is this, and <coughs> yeah, I think that might be might be really nice as well. Um, excuse me, we have a couple of questions up in the chat about um, how we are conversing with you now. Ken, how do you feel about this? Would this be something that auditionees should get very comfortable with, like audition in interviewing in sort of an inter um, a virtual setting like this? for the fall audition season type of thing? I personally would like to see it become part of it. I think it's really interesting to get a sense of who the, sing who the singer is as a human being. I think it would, there's always the issue of time because in any audition setting, people are trying to fit in as many singers as possible so they're very aware of time. But I would love a brief interaction to just get a sense of the person. So I, I would say, be prepared it may or may not happen but I, I personally like the idea a lot and I think I totally if, someone, agree with you. if someone was going to work with you or hire you or work with you as a conductor I think that would be really a bonus to get that sense. I totally agree with you and then uh, Lisa wants to know if we could comment on her dress and the space she is in for a virtual audition for example talking about the way that it's set up how it looks um, the track and the, the sound quality uh, for a virtual audition, I, I think if we look, were in that setting. I think the look is great. I mean, I love, I love the, the, the blank background. The dress is very dramatic. It's beautiful, mm -hmm. classic and simple, but, but theatrical. I always, it's a tricky mm -hmm. thing. I think that an audition, audition attire for both men and women should, you don't want to be in full concert attire necessarily, but you want to act like <laughs> an occasion. I, it's, it's like a mini, event or mini performance. So mm -hmm. I think 
for that. I mean, the sat, the track was, you know, it was, it was limited and tinny, but that's where we are. That's fine. But I thought visually, uh, it, it was very good, I thought. And I thought it was dramatic and compelling without anything extraneous. No, I agree with you. Um, Chloe, can we just talk, do you have an external mic over there? I do. Um, I'm not using it right now because <laughs> I just bought myself um, an XLR mic and I was okay. having, uh, I have a little, I, this is, I'm learning. Uh, I, have yeah. a little box. <laughs> um, I have a little box and it seems, I was nervous that um, it would only, I would only be able to hear you through the monitor coming out of the yeah. little box. So I didn't use it today. I just used, I have my iPad Pro set up. Um, okay. So that's what I use just for full disclosure. I did, I do have, again, the XLR mic, which is what I've been recording on, which I really love. Um, I would, but, yeah, I would be very curious to hear. Yeah, I'd yeah. be very curious to hear the difference between the iPad Pro and the external mic and how it actually might pick up more colors in your sound. Yeah. Because what um, the one thing that I really wanted, especially at the beginning, when you really got into it and grounded and you were so nice and open and all, everything was just flowing beautifully. At the beginning, I lost some of that resonance through the middle mm -hmm. voice. And I don't know if that's the mic or if it's that we just need to open through here just a little bit more to really allow the sound to come out. But I, I wonder about, I wondered about the external mic and if that might be something to, <clears throat> to just think about for the future. I mean, I can plug it in real quick if you want to hear a phrase. It's no, no, to it's, it's totally fine. I just wanted to kind of put that out there for you <laughs> in case, in case you hadn't went th through, you know, and bought the external mic and all that fun. Okay. Technology stuff that we have going on. Yeah, I thought it was it was really, really, really compelling. And uh, I agree. I, I really I think it looks great and you look great and and really you you're a strong contender. So figure out that the other yeah. couple of pieces in there that you really wanna, you Absolutely. know, hone in on and just ask a couple of pieces I forgot I wanted to ask about. Um, I'm not sure if um, I was thinking about the bigger Mozart, which is obviously the bigger Mozart pants rolls, but I was also entertaining the idea of, idea of Elvira. Mm -hmm. um, and I was also entertaining, I'm not sure if Favorita is too far or like... You mean O Mio Fernando? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't think it's too far because the role, I mean, if we think about O Mio Fernando as far as just the aria is concerned, it's one thing, but the role actually might sit better for you than just the aria because the role right. is actually sits a bit higher. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think, I think if you sang it with your voice and didn't try to whoop, beef it up, you know, yeah. in any way <laughs> because of a recording you heard or something like that, I think it would be great. But I'm going to turn that over to Ken because he's really yeah, the, uh, he's really the repertoire. Curious. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is, you know, the my two cents area. You know, a lot of our taste is formed by how we first heard <clears> the <throat> Right. When I was growing up, Favorito was a big guns Italian mezzo part. It was Simeonato, Cusotto, yeah. Robieri. And that, that is still in my, a, my ear. I, I think something I suggest to younger singers, if they're looking at making a step into that repertoire and it exists in a French version and an Italian version, you might want to look at Favori and do the aria, try the aria in French, because first of all, it's authentic. And second of all, the texture is lighter. And that mm -hmm. could be a way of exploring that. And I, I do, in general, would like to hear French repertoire. I was wondering about the Prince's aria from Cendrillon, if you ever looked at that, which is mm. really beautiful, very soulful and romantic. Ah, I haven't actually looked at it's that beautiful. one. It's beautiful. As far as Don Elvira, I, I would, be careful at the moment only, only because you're it's it's always going to be a, a fish and flock out there kind of thing and yeah. while any of you are establishing your identities to people don't confuse them too much i would, mm -hmm. I would keep the focus i think elvira is something that once you became more established and if you were talking to a conductor or an administrator and you've said you know i think elvira would be interesting that's how i would approach mm -hmm. that i wouldn't make it part of the package parto i think is a great idea yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Agree. I agree. I think, you know, I, I agree with Ken too, that in that I do hear a much bigger, juicier, fatter Verdian voice singing that role. Yeah. However, he might be right in, in that, you know, moving it and using it in the French might be a way to go. It, for Sopranos, the, the Don Carlo is, is really that same example. Cutuque mm -hmm. le vanita is heavy in the Italian. It's heavy. But when you put it in the French, somehow it sings easier. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it may be, it may be that's a good idea. But I, you know, I really, I really would hearken back to what Ken said earlier about the adult Jisa and the Sara and, and maybe yeah. go that round of road of bel canto and not maybe go into the heavier. But I, I think you have some, some great possibilities here for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't think you have any repertoire problems. I think you just no. focus in on what really just you love right. and feels great because you've got lots of right. possibilities. I'm just noticing a comment Sarah made here about she had sung for in French in Europe and got criticized. It's, you know, again, matter of opinion, it's still authentic. You can always stand by the authenticity. If the piece was written in French, then, you know, it's maybe personal taste, but you, you, you can't go wrong with it. Anyway. Agree. Thank you, Chloe, so much for sharing your voice. Thank today. you, Chloe. Bravo. All right, we're going to move on to Julia. Julia, are you there? Yes, hello. Yay, thank you. Go ahead, honey. Okay, so my name is Julia Claire Taylor, and today I will be singing Non Mi Dir from Don Giovanni with my um, app companist here. So if I have to adjust tempo, forgive that. Um, okay. <clears throat> Oh, 
sorry that your track kept doing <laughs> the stupid accompanist. Oh, oh my God, brava. Brava to you for staying with that damn thing. I, it's, it's a really hard medium and, and I, I, know, I know how hard it is, honey, I know. But brava to you for doing your own thing and adjusting as needed and being a pro and making it happen. Brava. Do you want to tell Ken and I what your other arias would be that you would present uh, in a competition? Sure. Uh, so I'm in a bit of a transition right now. Um, I previously would have presented something like Achichlipte, Adjunio Torpetita Tabe from Manon, um, even Fiordaligi from uh, Cozy. But um, I'm hoping to uh, present uh, coming soon um, Don Derieta from Boheme, um, hopefully the Bolero from uh, uh, Vesperi Siciliani, uh, Siciliani and um, oh gosh, my brain is blanking. I'm sorry. Um, I have, uh, and I also have an aria from Regina um, that's a little bit more theatrical and it better, it, I think it shows my acting well. Um, and uh, yeah, but I'm open to suggestions, obviously. <laughs> Ken, I'm gonna throw it. I'm gonna throw it over to you first. Okay. Um, first of all, I'll just say you know we all have our our arias, and No Media to me is one of those arias I'm still totally in awe of. I mean, I think that there's not a second that is not full of challenges and possibilities. I mean, there's mm -hmm. nothing that just nothing where not only the singer can coast, but I feel as a listener I can't coast. It's just mm -hmm. like so. Every, it just goes from moment to moment to moment of how is she going to do that? How is that going to work? So I think it's great to start with it again. If someone sang only no media, I would feel like I have already quite a complete picture. Again, I think you have a beautiful color and chord of the voice, which on that first crudele, it grabbed us right away. Uh, so I'm clearly, I'm, I'm a sucker for, for that. And I think it's a good beginning for you. Uh, the thing that, the only thing I would mention is this seemed to be a slight but fairly consistent intonation issue, and I'm not sure how much was the track and how much is there. I think that, you know, with any kind of recordings, and especially in Mozart because it's so exposed, and this is live, but I think if you're, if you're making a track, just be really, really care careful about intonation. But again, it may have just been working with that track. But, uh, yeah. but, but, but I will also say, I, I think that you're, you're slightly moved to, to slightly fuller repertoire. Again, I'd say full lyric, but that may mean different things to different people. I would also like to hear the Countess. I think uh, Il est du, il est bon would be beautiful. Mm. Um, Don Dorieta would be interesting. I was wondering, as a, as a 20th century, you mentioned, what, well, what about embroidery? Is that a possibility? I agree. You, from oh, Peter Grimes? Yeah. Yeah, I've definitely thought about the embroidery before and, and I intended to learn it and I never did. Yes, I'm, I'm going through a growth spurt right now a little bit. So I'm trying yeah. to... <laughs> well, again, as I said to Chloe, I like people to sing to their full healthy capacity without going beyond that. So I think what we're yeah. talking about is there. Another bigger aria, and it's, it's for a more mature character, but I think the aria stands by itself, is the aria from Vanessa, Do Not Utter a Word. Mm -hmm. uh, it was created by Eleanor Steeple, who was a great Donna Anna, which is maybe what made me think of it. But the aria, she, it does stand on its own. Uh, she's Agreed. a more mature character, but it's a fabulous aria. I don't know, it could be worth In this period, I think you're in the period now before you get to the new five. It's kind of fun to just try them on, sing through them, see yeah. how they fit the voice first, and then how they fit you emotionally in every other way. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you, Ken. And and I hear Julia going bigger as well. Um, and w Julia and I know each other. And she is making the transition from really singing light lyric color to her repertoire, <laughs> where wow. she was, I mean, she was really singing uh, Constanza and Manon and, and very small, you know, color to her repertoire. And I heard her immediately and said, Oh, my gosh, that voice is that's a big voice in there. Get that voice out of there. Um, so, but she still does have this amazing coloratura facility. Um, so we actually had talked about even something like Semirami Day where she could move the voice, but with that fuller, more open color. How do you feel about that? I think that's fine. Semirami Day is interesting. Not that the piece is done that often, but it's not caught in that same kind of uh, sense of Puritani or Sonambula, things like that. I think I right. mean, it, she is a kind of, queen and a, a, a bigger, more mature character. I think that would mm -hmm. be impressive. Again, coming back to what I said earlier, if you have 
colors or keep showing it off. Just keep yeah. adapting. When you when you said the bolero, I sort of perked up immediately. That was interesting. Um, I agree. Yeah, I agree. But I, I do hear it go. It's a very beautiful, creamy sound. And I thought you managed the color thrower well. I mean, you sang it with with your voice, and I thought that was impressive. I mean, clearly, you were you know you were keeping it in line and on track. So I think that's that's impressive. Thank I you. agree, and I think you know also it's it's for everybody on the class. It's important when we're going from one voice type into another voice type. And we're going a little bit bigger. Sometimes we're going to have a bit of a war going on in the throat, right? We're going to have a, does the larynx want to stay down? Does it want to come up? Does it want to stay down? Does it want to come up? And that can definitely take take some of the intonation and bring it into funny places. Yes, Alexandra put up in the chat just now, Jennifer, you sang wow. Turbinetta, right? Yes, I did. And <laughs> when I changed at 30 from singing coloratura repertoire to singing bigger spinto repertoire, I went through a point, I mean, years, three, two or three years, where every high note I sang was sharp, 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 sharp. Because in coloratura land, we narrow in the passaggio, in the secondo passaggio, to open and go up. But in spinto land and full lyric land, we have to keep that throat open through that secondo passaggio. And that was always something that was that was hard for me because the smaller repertoire, I sang it for so long, right? And Julia, you sang this color tour stuff for so long <laughs> that now to open that throat up and move into the bigger repertoire, kudos to you for getting up and doing it and putting it out there and making it happen. And, and as that throat settles and as that larynx settles and everything gets happy, those intonation problems will go away. So there's no worries about that. You just got to... You got to win that war in the throat. <laughs> you got to win no, that I'm war. Actually, I'm actually surprised and impressed <laughs> about your former color of your life because what I did here was a very beautiful, creamy, full lyric sound. So yes. I, so I'm, I'm, I was not getting any of that. Like, oh, she's she's trying to reinvent herself, and nature's not intending it to. <laughs> I think you're you're doing the right thing. Just a step slightly heavier than Don Delieta. What about Neda, the Balatella? Would that might yeah. that be a possibility? Oh, yeah. Actually, um, yeah, I've, I've always sort of loved that aria. I'd love to take a look mm -hmm. at that. That might be interesting. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah, for I sure. Know. I did. I did also used to sing the Goyescas aria, the Spanish piece. Um, I mean, that was maybe when I was a little bit younger as well. But like, yeah, I went through a Queen of the Night phase. I went through Constanza. It was, yeah, in my mall. Yeah. That's amazing. But it's getting bigger now, girl. You open that throat right up and it's getting bigger. So kudos to you and brava to you for yes. putting the new repertoire out in front of people for the first time on crazy Zoom <laughs> and making it happen. Brava, honey, brava. Um, anything Thank else you, you want to say, Ken, before we move on? Um, no, I, I think you're absolutely on the right track. I would totally support exploring this fuller repertoire. Great, fabulous. Julia, thank you so much, sweetheart. Thank you very much. All right, we're gonna move on to Joel. Are you there? Is he here? I'm here. Am I here? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello. I can hear you. We're good. Yes. Thank you. Hi. Go, Hi, go right ahead. I moved. I moved rooms during um, earlier. During earlier, because the internet was going in and out. So I was like, I think everything should still be connected. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> All right, go right ahead, sweetie. Hello, my name is Joel Balzen, and today I would like to sing Pietà Rispetto Amore from Macbeth. Raffermar sul trono, 
questa solita mi tette, o sbalzarmi per sempre. that you would present with this one? Yeah, so I'm currently trying to rotate out some rep. What I was bringing this past year was um, the confession scene from Dead Man Walking. Si Corre Down Ohio from Skiki. Swazi Mobile from William Tell. And then the fifth kind of depended day to day, but a lot of times I use Gilecki's aria from Peak Dawn. Okay. And then some arias I'm looking at for next season are Nemico della Patria from Andrea Chenier, uh, Commune par de Fleur from Amelie by Puma, and um, Robert's aria from Yolanta. Okay. 
Ken, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, first. I didn't, I didn't, what was the last one, Joel, that you mentioned this? Uh, Robert's aria from Yolanta. Oh, okay, great, great, okay, good. Um, I think you have a really beautiful, plush, warm sound, so that's great. Um, and I think the Macbeth, the Macbeth works fine for you. My, uh, being honest, my only concern is not the aria, it's the baggage of the entire role, because mm -hmm. the aria is, is quite long line and not that heavy. It's probably the, one of the more lyrical parts of the whole role. And I just, comes back a little bit to what we said earlier about, if possible not to present an aria from a role you might not sing. I think that it does send out, to me, if someone offers Macbeth, it sends out a signal of the biggest Verdi baritone roles. And, you know, again, coming from another age, that's sort of the whole, you know, Capriccioli, Bastianini, Warren kind of thing. I think, I think you could achieve the same success and the same goals with other arias that, you know, that would not suggest that. I mean, uh, some things I, 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 right away when I heard the beautiful sound, there's a real kind of plush quality to the voice. I thought of some of the bigger bel canto, some of the longer mm -hmm. line. Donizetti and Bellini, but Donizetti especially, Pagliuto, something like that, um, Favorita in French or English. Uh, so Italian, I hear a lot of bel canto. If you wanted Verdi, again, I always come back for a young baritone to Rodrigo number one. I think, mm -hmm. you know, I like, I, I maybe, I don't want to be too caught up on age appropriateness, but if possible, I just think if a character is age appropriate, it's one less thing that you have to overcome. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, and to me, Rodrigo is the, the younger and, and most lyrical of those parts. If you wanted to sing bigger Verdi, then I'd say maybe Ford, which is quite dramatic, mm -hmm. but is you're not carrying the show in the same way. I mean, to me, Ford is like a, a baby Verdi baritone in that the aria is incredibly intense and dramatic, but it's just really the aria and ensemble. So just being practical. Belcanto, I think, I think I hear a lot of French. I think uh, Zurga, Pearl Fetchers mm -hmm. would be beautiful for you, um, Onyegin. I don't know if you mentioned Onyegin, but the Onyegin aria I think would be would be beautiful. Um, so I, that's the direction I'm going in, is showing off that beautiful, warm, lush quality of voice in younger characters. Did you mention Skiki earlier? Yep. Yeah, see, I, I wouldn't go there necessarily. Um, mm -hmm. But again, if you wanted bigger, this Questo Amor from Edgar, which is gorgeous by Puccini, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about Silvio and Pagliacci? Mm -hmm. I've sung Silvio and it doesn't sit right. I've actually ah, okay. The okay. The prologue. You know, that's, that's the interesting thing about a session like this. Based on four minutes, I can hear something, but if the singer's already tried it out, then you've done all the, mm -hmm. you've done all the work, you know? Yeah. These, are, these are just me kind of throwing stuff out there. And if two or three of them feel good, that's great. But that's, that's how I hear it going is that, Play, I mean, anytime anybody has a beautiful voice and a warm sound, you want to play that up as soon as possible. So, Jen, over to you. No, I, I agree with you. I, uh, Joel, I know this is going to be a irky question, but I really love the top of the voice. And it blooms in such a way that makes me think you might be a tenor. I like held in tenor happy land up there. Have you ever heard that before? every few months. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever explored? Here's the reason I say that. A held in tenor is basically a baritone with a high extension, right? So pretty much a held in tenor doesn't sing above a B flat. There's some B flats in Otello. There's a B flat in Fanchula. Uh, Tristan, I think, has one. Really, we don't go up above the B flat. And you seem like the A is super easy. So that says to me that the B flat might also be super easy. <laughs> do you, how do you, I mean, have you talked about that with your team and, and the people that you're working with? Yeah, we, it comes up every few months and then I run back to my team and I'm like, I got it again, is it time? And they're like, no. <laughs> so, I mean, and I don't know if I will go down that route. I've looked at, I've like entertained it once and like read through, I don't remember which aria, but I read through something. And uh -huh. it feels awful. Is it? Well, but here's the thing. You have to turn a little differently than you do as a baritone. So, for example, right now, where do you think that, where do you think of your turn happening? Uh, at E, most of the time. At, at E? I can sing an E open if I really want. 
but I prefer to turn it and I've been turning more on E flats recently. Yeah. Yeah. That, the tenor really, I mean, the baritone, obviously, yes, E flat needs to turn, but as we go up into the top, you might even want to start on the D, but for tenor land, that E flat and the E is really where the comfortable turn is to go up for the A flat and the A. So if you're already doing that, it probably is just a matter of where the larynx is placed in the turn. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? <laughs> and I, I just, I, I hear your speaking voice too. And I just wonder if, I just, I just wonder if maybe what you tried wasn't quite the right tenor repertoire. Do you know what I mean? Because the held in tenor repertoire, I'm, I'm very serious with you. If you say Zygmunt, or it, it's literally the same range of what you just sang. Right. Quite literally, exactly the same. But it, the color of your voice is so great up there. And then the bottom, I lose some of it. And that tells me that perhaps you, you actually want to sit a little bit higher. Could, would you mind to try something for me? Of course, yeah. All right, sweet, sweet. Uh, just um, e, uh, like a French E vowel for me. E, 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 Is your larynx staying down or popping up on that E flat? Can you check? E now it's staying down. There we go. <laughs> Try again. E again. Do that one and don't let your larynx pop up. Keep that sucker down. One more. Keep the larynx down through the turn. back a little bit on the top for me. So, e and stretch open the pharynx in the back around the soft palate. I mean, that's a B flat. I, I, all I'm saying is, I, I would have a hard time on an audition panel, if I heard your voice with as free and easy as it is up top, because I would be saying to myself, the middle doesn't sound baritonal to me. The middle sounds like a tenor. And I would have a hard time because I would want to give you money, <laughs> but I would want to say, honey, take this money and go for a tenor. <laughs> because it's really, your, your voice is, is excellent and you're a really handsome guy, and you've got great style. I love, I'm looking at the headshot. I love the headshot. It's really great. But sometimes the repertoire holds us back. Sometimes if we're not really singing where our voice wants to be, even though we are very, very talented, and you are very, very talented, I wonder if it's holding you back from the step that will really take you into those major A houses around the world. If you, if you just take a few months and explore the upper register and see what might come out. Sure. Because that's a pretty damn easy B flat for a baritone. It didn't feel easy. <laughs> it looks and sounds easy. I mean, listen, 
high notes are never easy, right? Everybody says to me all the time, oh, your high C is so easy. And I'm like, oh my God, no, it's not. I'm like, Bleh! right? Because you're thinking technique and this and that and the other thing. But to us, it vibrates in a different way. Have a thought on it because it, I just, the, the chat also blew up, just so you know. I wasn't the only one thinking it. Pop-ups right below your chin. <laughs> What'd you say, honey? I said, I keep seeing pop-ups right below your chin. Yeah. <laughs> hello, hello. Yeah, no, I just, I know for me, when I was your age, when I was 29, that I hit a roadblock at a certain point where people stopped taking me seriously because I wasn't willing to move out of the coloratura repertoire because I thought that's what I am. And then I went to Italy to study and they said in Italy, you are not a coloratura soprano, you are a spinto, you need to be singing Verdi. Yes, you can sing coloratura things like Trovatore and things like that, Ernani, blah, blah, blah. But you are not Lucia, you are not, period. And I, I, I was like, what, what do you mean I'm not Lucia? I love Lucia. <laughs> but when I started exploring the bigger repertoire at 30, that's when my world opened. That's when I started winning competitions. That's, that's when I started really having success. And it's because I had something in my head that I thought I was, but everyone else was hearing something different. And if I'm not the first person to say that, it's, a, it's just a possibility that it might be holding you back a little bit. And I say that because I, I really think you're super, super talented. Thank you. Yeah. Is it just in your head? Do you think, a t can you make a, make a sound of what you think a tenor sounds like? <laughs> no, I'm serious. Here, I'll just give you this no, right I'm here. This is easy for you. <laughs> Just make us make a sound of what you think on top of tenor is supposed to sound like. Same exercise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Try. Can I try it just on yeah, 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 yeah? Yeah, try yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't care. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, well, that's fabulous. Your larynx is a little high, but it's still a great sound. So what's so wrong with that? <laughs> Try that with a low larynx now. I mean, it seems pretty damn free to me. <laughs> Bonnie Joy. Okay, I hear you, Tenore. I hear you too. <laughs> I, listen, I, I just feel like, I just feel like you have to explore the possibility that a new world will open up for you if you kind of explore the, the, the other repertoire. That's all. Totally. No, every, I hear everything that you're saying and I'm going to okay. talk about it with, yeah. with my team. So, yeah. Um, talk to your team. Talk to your well, team. I'm and like, oh, I don't like this. <laughs> no, no. And I, I, you know, if it, uh, I didn't want to do it either, <laughs> to be honest with you. I wanted to do what I was comfortable with because I don't like change. I hate change, right? But at a certain point, you just have to be like, all right, it comes up a lot. Maybe I have to play with it. If I were to explore that and have like one or two pieces as a vehicle to like practice on, mm -hmm. would I want to look at arias or art songs or does it matter? I mean, I think you can look at some of the arias because that's going to inform you the most if that's really where you want to sit. Um, I mean, fanchula is a good one that people, it's easy and, and flowing and, and too, huh? Yeah, que la micreda. Yeah, que la micreda. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, look at some of the, the Wagner stuff. Look at the last Otello aria. It's not hard. You meet them, it's very, very easy. Amor ti vieta, uh -huh. Lensky is low, you know? Yeah, there's, there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of possibilities for you to try. Ken, I, how do you feel about this, Ken? Would you, uh, would you have any recommendation over there? 
Uh, okay, well, I've, I've had this conversation with many young baritones going back to Tom Hansen onwards. Are you a tenor or are you a baritone with really good high notes? Um, what I, I'll be honest, I, certainly in the exercises, especially the last one, I was suddenly hearing a tenor ring because mm -hmm. I kept mentioning a warmer sound, which didn't suggest, I, I'm a big believer in color, not just range, but also the color of a voice. And I was not hearing so much of a tenor color until you started doing the exercises in the beginning. I mean, I think in a way, someone wrote in the chat, a couple of things interesting in the chat. Someone said, it's not just a technical thing, it's an emotional thing, which I think it is. And you've touched on that. Uh, Alex wrote cha-ching in the, in the chat. <laughs> and, and, there is no denying there's a lot of good young lyric baritones and not so many good young dramatic tenors. I think if you if you were to go tenor, I think it is a more dramatic tenor for sure. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, have you worked on specific arias, uh, tenor arias, or just kind of tried exercises? Just exercises and like read through an aria just to see. I mean, it may be that this is a time since we, something we all have now is more time to study and, and work this might be a time to explore it and feel like you fully, fully explored it. I mean, and you're 29, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, that's, that's an age when it could happen. But as I said, I think the Puccini arias are a good place to start. Lenski. Yeah. I'm, I'll be honest, having lived through this a couple of times, more than a couple of times, it's turned out that the people I've known and worked with have remained baritones with good high notes. Mm. But I think something this important, I mean, there's no question, if you're suddenly a young, budding, dramatic tenor, that opens up incredible doors. I think you owe it to yourself to explore it to the fullest. I do think that if, if you ultimately decide that's not where you're comfortable living, I, I worked, I didn't work with, but um, there was a period that Mark Oswald, when, when, when Mark Oswald was a young baritone, he had high notes that didn't quit. And he would sing Carmina Burana, and people would say, my God, you're a tenor. And he said the minute he tried to sustain it, it didn't work. So you're never going to know that until you sustain it. I mean, it's interesting because the exercises that Jennifer just did with you was how Joan Sutherland became a coloratura because she was singing <laughs> Spinto repertoire and Bonning tricked her and kept vocalizing her higher and higher and said, well, that yeah. was just an E naturally, you sang. So I think my, my feeling is more maybe a little conservative is to fully, fully explore it. So whichever way it goes, you may say, I am a tenor. It could happen at 29. 29 is an interesting time for yeah. a tenor to be sort of born. If it doesn't fully work, then you, you, you will feel like you fully explored it. And I think that you can have a viable career as, as a full lyric baritone. That's, that's my old term. So yeah, I mean, I've, heard, I've, heard, I've heard some young women who were singing as a lyric mezzo, but it really it's clear that it was a rite of passage. It was just a matter of time. And the voice just wanted to go up and up and up. And finally, they couldn't deny it. I'm not getting that with you. I, I think that if you remained a baritone and sang some of this higher repertoire, you will have a very viable career and shot at it. But I think you owe it to yourself based on the conversation a little bit we heard to explore it and feel like you've really given it a shot. I, I, I think you have to live there a little while in your mind and, and, and your voice just, you know, for a couple of weeks or even a couple of months, mm -hmm. see what the tenor thing feels like. Things, sing through some arias. You know yeah, what would be I, an ideal situation for you, and this is the, the perfect scenario, would be a major, major opera company with a young artist program that understands the situation and is willing to give you a couple of seasons to maybe yeah. sing smaller, you know, there are, in, in operas like Parsifal or Zalame, there are small but important tenor parts that you have to sing with fullness and heft that are great transitions without singing one of these marathon roles. In a perfect world, I would say a safe environment where people understand the possibility of the scenario would be ideal. So yeah. you, want, you want to sort of say, how close can I come to that? You um, just, I don't have your resume right. Ken, I love that. That's a great idea. I think that's, I mean, that's really what I did too. I mean, you, you, you find a young artist program that's, that's got great education and, and really can nurture that process. Um, something popped up in the chat, uh, Joel, and it really made me um, um, ping something. Uh, Fatou Suswe is, uh, is on the class today and Fatou is a held in tenor. He sang for us on, on David's class. Oh, incredible held in tenor voice. He started with Wintersturmer, 
So maybe it's just a matter of looking at a couple of these arias and seeing, you know, give them a couple of weeks to live in the voice because obviously none of us know, you know, when I pick up a new aria, it always sounds like crap. It's terrible. <laughs> it needs to marinate a little bit. It needs to work into the muscles of the throat. You need to work the technique into it. You need to relax the larynx around it, relax the breath, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, learning notes, it takes you out of that mindset. So maybe try something like Vinterstruma, which is very easy and short and, and, you know, simple to learn and see if you can work that lowered larynx and happy lar laryngeal tilt and open pharyngeal space around that and then see how you feel, you know, a few weeks or a few months after that. Yeah. And it's kind also, of also keep in mind that if you, if that is a successful route towards Zygmunt or some of the Wagner, then 29 and 30 is suddenly very young. Then you're at yes. the kind of beginner's age for that repertoire. Uh, the, two, the two lower, more baritonal transition parts, the Zygmunt and Parsifal, are the two mm -hmm. that have the most baritonal esoteria, so probably would be a transition. Also, just practically speaking, remember that that repertoire is only done in the States at the very biggest houses. Um, so, you know, that would be another thing just practically to think about. I think, I think your voice should determine everything. You can't yeah, say, well, sure. tenors work more than baritones, so I'll be a tenor. It's, it's really about just be as good as you're going to be. I think that if it turns out that the, some of that repertoire is to explore, then, then a European audition tour might be uh, interesting to get into a a smaller house where you could sing the repertoire in a human sized theater and, and be coached and sing a number of performances and not have that same kind of pressure. That could be another awesome. scenario. Mm -hmm. And there are foundations and competitions for developing dramatic and Wagnerian voices. Absolutely. So if, if you get to that point, that may be, that may also be the way to go. Right. But I would, I would say for now, I would say explore it fully to your satisfaction. So that whenever, whichever way you go, you're comfortable with the, with the path you took. Definitely, yeah. And I was gonna say, it's comforting to note you said, Ken, like, look at it for a couple weeks or a couple months. And in my head, I think before when people are like, maybe you should go to Heldon Center, I'm thinking like, okay, I have to explore for five years before I make a decision. And no, then, no, 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 but I think I think better. you'll know, you, you may not have polished performances of those arias, but you'll know in your throat and in your heart if there, if it's a path to continue on or not, I think. Yeah. No, and Ken, you're absolutely right. Try, give it obviously more than a read through. Yeah, mm -hmm. reading through an aria is not gonna tell you anything, but giving it, like Ken said, a couple weeks, a couple months, live in it, see how you feel, see, play with the repertoire. I mean, it's, you know, you're gonna be able to sing all of it. It's all, you know, in the same tessitura as what you just sang. So just yeah, about, give it a try. What about um, Max's aria from Freischitz, which is certainly big and hefty, but it's coming from a kind of romantic thing. So I don't oh, yeah, know, yeah. sometimes that sometimes is a, the, the musical style is not as advanced as Wagner. It's an earlier kind of music, but certainly requires tons of heft and high notes and stuff. So Max's first aria from Freischitz is maybe a, a thing to try out, to play with. Yeah, agree. Joel, thank you for being willing and open to that yes. conversation, honey. Oh. <laughs> bravo, bravo. It's hard, it's, hard to, it's hard to have that conversation on at any level in any voice type, but you're a true sport and you, you are so exceptionally talented. So, so thank you for humoring me for a second on that. <laughs> thank you, Joel, so much. Okay, we're going to move on to Miss Melina. Melina, are you there? Hi, hello. Oh. Hi, hon.
Brava. Great job. Brava. Fantastic. Melina, tell us what the other uh, pieces would be around this aria. Brava, brava. So, Ernani Bolami, um, and I would consider starting with that for a competition, but there's a lot of debate. Um, the Guillaume uh, Tell for Notre Amour from the Rossini. Um, Come Scoglio, um, which could possibly be Non Mi Dir or like any number of Mozart arias. I've now studied all of the big five, so you know, that's, that's a, those are all possibilities. Um, Chardash, probably. And um, English is debatable. I could do like a Tobias Picker, like Emmeline. Um, there, you know, the the English could be any number of things. Embroidery. Um, I have been singing governess, but I think my voice is getting bigger, so I think I might be looking at some different repertoire. Um, I think that's all. Yeah. Fabulous. Ken, I'm gonna throw it over to you. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, Melina. I didn't hear all of your arias. I got Shada, Sernani, Comescolio. I'm gonna put on my. Yeah, Melina, turn your mic up a little bit. Yeah, no, the thing is, is I was blowing out the mic. I need to get new mics. And I, I just, during the master class, I was like, I need a mic consultation. Staff, please. <laughs> um, so, um, Ernani Volami, um, the Guillaume Tell um, that Jen Raleigh sings amazingly. It's very, very uh, fioratory. Um, Chardash. And uh, there are a bunch of English options. Come Scoglio. Um, but other Mozart options, I, any of the big Mozart right now um, could be. Okay, great, thanks. Um, well, I've, I've said this before, but I really mean it. There is so much color and core to your voice, uh, and that is so important. I mean, that's, that's that door. Remember in the beginning, I was talking about grabbing people. It, you almost don't intellectualize it. You just have an emotional response. And I've heard that today with everybody, but you're, you're really strong in that area. I loved, uh, I loved all the emotional colors you brought to it, because, I mean, you know, we tend to think of Nedda one way or the other, either she's very pensive or very, you know, uh, she's, we kind of know the tragedy that's to follow, but I felt you had these different colors and flashes going by that you really did have a sense of humor. You were having moments in the sun that everything faded away. So I thought, I thought as a performance, it was really great because on one hand, Balotelli is a very valuable standard aria, but on the other hand, it's so Italian it that if you don't bring something of that, and I, I thought that you did. I also really love that you access your chest voice, that you go in and out. It was a pleasure to hear that. I think that's something we don't hear or talk about enough today. Um, so I, I really enjoyed it. I found it a very compelling performance of a standard aria. Um, uh, Jen mentioned the wonderful Donald Rosenberg earlier, who's heard a million auditions, and someone said, don't you ever get tired of hearing such and such an aria? And Lenore said, not if it's done well. And you know what? Why do you think those of us who love in opera, who love opera and work in opera come back and want to hear the same aria or song sung over and over and over again? It's not because we're crazy. We want to hear what a new or young singer brings to it. And that is so exciting. So it's great if you make people feel like they're hearing a familiar aria in a way for the first time. So, so that's great. Um, I think, um, I, I'll just tell you a very quick story. I, I keep mentioning color. <clears throat> I judged a competition one time and we did the semifinals and a singer I had really liked didn't make the finals. And I was walking home on the west side with another judge and I said, I can't believe so-and-so, it was a baritone, didn't make the finals. I said, he is the color of his voice is so gorgeous. She said, okay, and let's face it, you're a sucker for a voice with color. And I literally stopped in the middle of Broadway and almost got hit by a car because it was a revelation to me that everybody didn't feel the same way. But to me, that, that's, where, that's where personality, individuality, that's where it all kicks in as if you're tapping into your color. Um, just another aria, I, I think the Guillaume Tell is a very interesting idea. I like that idea a lot. Of course, if I heard this, I would want to hear something that moved, either Ernani or the Shardas. I think with your sense of fun, Shardas could be great. I'm a big fan of Shardas, by the way. I think people have mixed reaction, but I, I love it. It always kind of gets me going. Just another Italian at aria that I love that I think you could bring a lot to is the aria from Lamico Fritz, Son Pochi Fiori, mm. which mm. is kind of me, me, wait, but it's got this beautiful melancholy quality. It's, her, it's Suzelle is the character, S-U-Z-E-L by Mascagni, and it's her entrance aria, Son Pochi Fiori. It's, if you want something in the me, me vein, but different, it, it fits that. But yeah, and, and 
I'm sorry. So French would be the Guillaume Tell, right? Right now. What about what about Il est du or even? Um, I mean that I I love that. I I mean I'm a, I'm a big. I, I, I was offering that for a while, and um, of course I would always love to sing it. I think um, yeah yeah, and I I, I tend to go to uh, uh, auditions with five arias and then like ten other arias that I'm also offering um, <laughs> because because everyone is always confused by my voice, and I've just um, had certainly a time, and uh, I'm a former contralto, so. Um, and like a lot of my resume just is like, it's just bizarre. So um, yeah, that, I, I would definitely, I'd love to sing that again. It's such a gorgeous aria. Yeah, no, I was just, I'm just reading some of the chat too, which is also really interesting. I think because of the darker color of your voice, yours is the kind of voice that people might want to move towards bigger repertoire quickly. I don't know, but it's possible. As I say, it's all, it's all about the balance. I mean, <clears throat> don't sing too heavy too soon, but on the other hand, when the time comes, then don't deny it. You know, it's, it's a delicate balance because singing too heavy, of course, can be dangerous, but eventually reining a voice in and singing too light when the voice wants to move beyond it. But I think the color of your voice would indicate certainly that it could go, and your temperament too, both of those yeah. things. But, Ken, how do you yeah. feel about Elsa? Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Now, that would be beautiful. I mean, you know, you know what's funny? That lighter Italian repertoire used to have a much more Italian tradition. In the, in the older days, if you read about any of the great Italian lyric sopranos, they all sang Elsa, all of them, mm -hmm. Tomaldi and everybody. And it fits with this repertoire. It's so, so I think lyric, that would be, and it would be very high. beautiful, I think. Yeah, I agree with you. I'd love to hear her sing something in German. I just love that that rich warmth through the middle. And I, I do, Melina, I, I do love that chest voice. <laughs> I really do. It makes me so happy. But I, yeah, I, I hear her, I, I love the repertoire and I, I hear it maybe wanting a little Germanness. I, I'd really love to hear what Elsa maybe did, maybe what Arabella does. Yeah. Um, I was, something. I was, I was starting with um, her, her, her final aria. Mm -hmm. um, for a while, but I don't think it's a good starter for me. Um, but I'm happy to bring it back because I mean, it's the new, I don't know, I'm a huge Elf fan, like, I could listen to And it. someone just mentioned Agata and Farshitz. Also, if you wanted yeah. Slavic, Agata would be beautiful. What about uh, Lisa and Peak Dom? Lisa Zaria from Peak Dom. Yes. So that's been a huge question. Um, right now, my coach thinks that that would be a, uh, a little, he doesn't think the role would be right for me, but for the Aria, oh my God, yes. I, would, I mean, watching Lisa sing it at the Met this year, like, I, it's like the world was, over, like, the, the world ended. It was so beautiful. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'd love to sing that. <laughs> I love it. I think, I mean, I think you're really on the right path. Don't you agree, Ken? Yes, very much so. And I think you've got a lot of possibilities, and all of them are very realistic possibilities, I think. Yeah, I totally agree. Melina, bravissima. Thank you so much, hon. We're going to move on to Mr. Anthony. Anthony, are you there? Anthony. Hi. Hi. Oh, hi. Go right ahead, hon. Hello, my name is Anthony Charamitaro, and I'll be singing Notte Perpetua Notte from Verdi's I Due Foscheri. Oh, 
preciso crescio, ferocemente con la manca porta. Bravissimo. Um, Anthony, did you turn the original sound on the Zoom before you started singing? I did. Did you? You did. That, um, your, oh, oh, do you have an external mic on there or are you just using your phone? No, it's just the iPhone. Okay. For, so for the future, because your voice is so fabulous and wow, what a beautiful color and cut. And, oh, just awesome. For the future, when you have to make a recording or do something on Zoom, you have to get an external mic because your iPhone is like, no, and it's shutting down all your sound in the middle. Normally I, I use a, I bought a Blue Yeti and I use that, but it, it doesn't allow you to speak to me. So I'd have to, uh, like, have have to, to talk. Like... Yeah, yeah, okay. So just, just for future, just because I want you to be super successful because you are just super talented, just, if we're gonna have to work in the virtual medium, the iPhone is like, nope, compress you. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. just just for for future reference. Anyway, what would the other arias be that you would take along with this? Uh, fra poco from Lucia, Adio from uh, Madame Butterfly, uh, Afouillé from Manon, and Quoi mm. uh, from Verter. Nice. Ken, I'm going to throw that over to you. Uh, well, it was, it was a pleasure to hear. You know, it's, it's always a great criteria for me is will I remember a voice when this is over, when I walk away? <laughs> and Anthony, you have that kind of a voice that I, well, stays in my ear and I'll remember it. So that's, that's great. It's a pleasure to hear such incredibly Italian at singing. It seems organic and it's not, unfortunately, not too common today, although it doesn't mean I wouldn't want to hear you sing other repertoire as well. I hear... It's funny, the first aria I wrote was Edgardo, because there were certain similarities with this. I mean, this is this is a beautiful aria because even though it's not well known and not the opera's not done that often, it's it's very easy to wrap your ear around. It still is Verdi style and it, it speaks to Bel Canto also. So I think it's it's a fine aria that the aria is not known, but the style is. So it will represent it suggested to me things like Edgardo and the Duke immediately. Um 
I, th I think as far, as far, I'm sorry, go ahead. We, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Um, other arias, I just think for practical reasons, the Traviata aria with the Cabaletta would be valuable just because it's standard bread and butter. Um, you know what I would, an aria that I love for an Italian tenor that is very different in mood is Renuccio's aria from Johnny Schicchi. I mm. love, I love the mood, the words, the tempo. It's so uniquely different. And it's also a role that you could be cast in by any company like tomorrow. So it's a practical role and people do Schicchi a lot. And it would change the mood of the rep. Go ahead. Yeah. Would you, would you put that into a competition class or more of an audition package for a company? Uh, I would say either. I've seen people really pull it off. I know someone who won a lot of competitions doing Renuccio. So, uh, Sorry, I'm more about the, the Traviata. The Renuccio, I agree entirely. I, I, I think the Traviata for a competition with at least one verse of the Cabaletta. I think it, okay. it changes the impressiveness once you put the Cabaletta in. So, you know, if, if you're not doing the Cabaletta, you're much better off with this or other Verity. Have you worked on the Duke's big big aria, the LME Flu yet? Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and then, of course, just as a quick change of pace, uh, actually, Questo Quella is great. Also, if you want something, you know, different in mood and tempo. Um, and there's also, you mentioned uh, Afouye. I can certainly hear you sing a ton of French mm -hmm. repertoire. You know what I would, I immediately heard your voice in, um, there's a bunch of operas where the opera is not done anymore, but it has standout arias that are famous. Do you know the aria from Le Cid by Massenet, Au mm Souverain? -hmm. I I can hear your voice in it immediately. It just it just jumps out. There's, there would be a, a really an amazing connection from Le Cid by Massenet, Au Souverain. Okay, I'll look yeah. at it. But I mean, a lot of this Romeo, I think, would be would be wonderful. So, I mean, you, I don't know, Jennifer, you you say whatever you'd like, and then if Anthony has questions or wants to talk more. That's yeah, great. no, I I think I think that's awesome. I think all that stuff is fantastic. Um, I was thinking about the Levili aria actually. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, I think that. Have you ever done that, Anthony? I have not. Oof, it's so great. I mean, obviously not standard repertoire, but wow, is it beautiful. 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 And it's really one of those arias, too, that if you're, again, like Ken said at the beginning of the class, if you're ever asked to sing on a concert, like on a gala, it's one of those arias that obviously we don't do the opera so much, but in a gala, it really stops the show. And yeah. the orchestration is absolutely stunning. I mean, just really, really beautiful. You know, I was also thinking as like a little change of pace. What about the Italian singer? Oh, uh, I, fun. Yeah. Uh, here we go. I... I've, I've uh, offered it. My my teacher likes to. Or my teacher has given me some new suggestions, and so we have um, the. the oh, okay, so the you're like theater. rotating it. It's rotating yeah. out. Okay, yeah. okay. But yeah, I, I think it as a competition or a gala piece, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm just thinking about if there's a possibility of any German. I mean, I know you have such an Italian and gorgeous voice, but I'm just thinking if there's a possibility to add like, is it? Do you have an English option? Um, I'm, I'm toying between either the view from the bridge, the Balkan, um, mm. uh, oh, what's that? New York lights. Yeah. 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 The New York lights or, um, I know that you all hate me from the stain of Bleecker street. Those are yeah. That's what I was going to say was that I know you all was, hate me. <laughs> I was going to say the Bleecker street too. I think the Bleecker street is more impressive because it's almost like a Puccini. Yeah. Shana. New York lights is beautiful, but it's more like a show tune where the Bleecker street I think is, is really impressive. What about Lenski? Have you ever worked on Lenski? Mm. Uh, I, I know Lenski very well. It was one of my first arias. Uh, it's just not very high. Yeah. Right. right. Uh, yeah. No, it, it, you know, Lenski is fantastic artistically and expressively, but it doesn't answer questions about high notes. Just coming back to the Vili aria, I second that. It is a gorgeous, soulful, heartfelt aria. That was the aria that Michael Fabiano wrote to success for you. That oh, was really? Aria. Oh, I didn't even that was, know that. That was Michael's <laughs> aria. It became his, his theme song, which is great if that happens. But the Vili aria is gorgeous. You know, the, the, the Pinkerton arias are really nice and everything, but the Vili is really special. Yeah, Vili. it's really... Okay. What, honey? The Vili. Yeah, Le, Le, Vili. Le Vili by Puccini, yeah. Yeah, I, I just remember doing... I did Le Vili at Spoleto Festival. Another thing that Lenore gave to me from competitions was singing at Spoleto Festival. And I did the Levili, and I've never seen it done before, but um, Dean Yarvanya was singing that role in that production with me. And I'm not kidding you, I, thought, I worked real hard all night. 
and that one aria just stopped the whole show and it was like what soprano what who is she <laughs> it really is it's fabulous it really 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 is i mean if i were a tenor that's definitely something i would be singing because it's really it's quite spectacular one german I, aria that again the opera's not done that much, but it's gorgeous, is Mary Wives of Windsor Fenton Serenade by mm. uh, uh, Nikolai. It's a gorgeous German romantic aria, strophic aria, really beautiful. It, was a, big, it was a big Fritz von Delish piece uh, in his, yeah. In his, yeah, yeah. It's really beautiful. Anthony, it was, it's stunning. Uh, no, no, Jennifer, you. No, no, I, I was just gonna say that the voice is, is stunning, so really anything, I mean, he could sing the phone book and we, <laughs> we would all be fine. <laughs> It's a really, really, really great. So, um, and Ken, you know, we, keep, would... we keep saying Italian and Italian, which is true, but that's no reason not to want to hear that quality in French or Slavic music. So it's great. Yeah, to, I'm to just thinking English. about like as a competition list, having the multiple options. You know, obviously, we we don't need to have four Italians and one French if you can do so many things because your voice is so well lined up and the technique is so beautiful. So I, I just was thinking of one other language, just trade out one Italian for the English or German or just one other thing where we could have just a little more variety in the competition list. That's, I mean, obviously if, if you're going in and you know, you're going to auditions for, for Duca and, on, and all these beautiful Italian things, then you take your Italian list with your one French aria that's what I do. But I do feel like for a competition, we just, we just need one, one more language just to really like round out that whole list and make it, and make it really viable as, as uh, I am Anthony and I am the winner of this competition. <laughs> so yeah, uh, fantastic work on yep. really. But you have, really. Anthony has a question, I think. Yes, yeah, sweetie, go ahead. On a competition list, would you prefer it to be English, German, or Russian? If you, were like, yes, I like this list. Out of my five, you'd want to see English, German, or Russian. Speaking practically, I'd say English, just because, mm -hmm. I mean, that's there's so much American or British or newer opera being done. I, again, it comes back to what you do well. Again, people may not think they want to hear you say something, but if you can convince them, then, then all bets are off, then, you know. But I would say just in answer to that question, I think we're having to struggle a little bit with the German aria right now, but, English would be valuable, yeah. I think. I mean, yeah, my, totally. my, at the moment, if I had to sing something in German, would probably be Dinis uh, Mein Herz. Well, that's mm -hmm. fine. That's fine. Mm -hmm. That's great. I mean, I we didn't touch on this, but I actually really like operetta repertoire as long as it requires legitimate singing. And let me tell you, if you're sitting on a panel all day and someone comes in around 4.30 and sings Dinis Mein Ganzes Herz, we're very happy to hear it. So that that is actually <laughs> a, a great German choice for you. But now, I totally agree. Anthony, thank you so much. Really fantastic, fantastic thing, singing. Um, guys, I'm going to open it up to some question and answer here in the last couple of minutes. And while we're getting our questions into the chat, I'm going to scroll back to the beginning of the class, Ken, where um, someone wanted to know if there are any competition arias that are, or any arias that are just a no for competitions that are just, you don't want to hear them, they don't do anything for you, any, any arias which are just, no. I'll tell you, it's, it's somewhat personal taste. I mean, the, again, you can't adjust your list to every judge's personal taste. I will say, and this may surprise you down there, we're, we're being honest, <clears throat> a very hard one to pull off is O Quante Volte from Capoletti, mm. because it's very long. It's got a really extended recitative, which you can't really cut. It's, it's an integral part of the aria, but it's very, very hard to bring that to life, I would say. So that's one. Now, I've been proved wrong. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, you know uh, one day years ago, Nadine Sierra came in, she sang Aquanta Volte and all of Aunt True Love, and we loved it. And those are, yep. those are two kind of no no arias. And so, we, we, we love to be proved wrong. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I would say, look at the length of the aria versus the variety of skills it's going to show us, if that makes sense. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, non media is long-ish, not terribly long, but it shows so much. Where if an aria is strophic, you know, something like the Anna Bolena final scene is hard to pull off. I think that 
be aware that a competition, unfortunately, time is always something that we're aware of. Mm -hmm. And again, I think you can show at least some of those skills in a more, a more compact aria. I think, I think yeah. high sopranos have the biggest problem because that's where the arias tend to be mad scenes or longer. Hamlet's a hard, Hamlet mad scene is hard to pull up. But again, yeah, it's so long. I mean, again, I mean, I, I'll be honest, if the baritone sings this, it goes right past me. I don't, I don't even hear it. And yet other colleagues feel, well, it's rangy and it's, it would be good to hear at least a verse. So we all have our, our blind spots, you know? Yeah, totally. I but agree. Be aware, be aware of if something is 11 minutes long, you better be showing a lot of variety. Yes, because you probably won't get asked for a second piece. I mean, especially with so many things having a 10 minute um, time slot, you know, a, a 10 minute, uh, uh, you get 10 minutes to show your stuff. And if you show 10 to 11 minutes in your first aria, there's you have to be okay with the fact that there's no time to ask you for and anything else. And just being else. aware, I get very frustrated by the shortness of the time periods too. The reason for that is trying to fit in more and more singers. So it's, it's the balance. You know, they're trying to. I just saw a question here. If you hear 65 comes go use in a day, should we steer clear? <laughs> Not if you think it's your best aria. If you're yeah. waiting to go in and the soprano before you sang comes go and you say, "Damn it, this is my best aria," then just go in and say, then "Go in and sing it." Again. Yeah, absolutely. You go in and you present what you and do the best. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Aaron Mole wants to know how much does pedigree play into a judge's decision? Uh, I think pedigree is interesting on paper. The minute someone opens their mouth, then it pedigree can go out the window. I mean, I think pedigree unfortunately plays a factor if people are making some kind of cut. Then if they mm. see all kinds of high quality young artist programs <clears throat> or schools or other awards. Yeah. But you know what? I think the minute the singer opens their mouth, all of that goes out the window. Then, then they're standing on their own talent and what they have to offer. I mean, mm -hmm. I've heard many people that didn't have much pedigree and I've been blown away by them. So it's definitely possible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, anybody else want to ask some more questions into the chat before we let Ken go? I'm just scrolling back to see if there's anything else we missed here. This has been if super I can just informative. To Lena specifically, I had actually oh. thought, of, where are you? I had just thought of Pleure Mesier also. It is darker and bigger, but I think it would be actually a good aria for you. So I, I it was in my mind. So that was just- Oh, fabulous. Sorry, question. Melina, I started yeah. scrolling up before I saw your question. Sorry, honey. <laughs> awesome. Well, guys, this has been super informative. Ken, thank you so much for being with us today. I loved it. The time flew. Really, so it's, it's really fabulous. And, and all of the information has been just incredibly helpful. And I know that every single person on this meeting will have gained something fabulous um, from the day. I'm seeing a couple more things pop up. Let's just see what we got here. Do you think competitions will be more forgiving on age because of the pandemic? That's interesting You know what? Question. I have actually raised this question myself to some competitions and said, you know, some people were at a cutoff perhaps of 30 or 35. It's really not fair if they lose the chance. And most competitions I've spoken to have been very cognizant of that and very open to seeming advancing the age limit for a year or two because of the pandemic. So I think that that's gonna be factored in favorably. I think I heard that the Met competition was actually raising the age one year. Really? Like that actually has come out already or, or last week or something on, on social media. So that's I good. think they're, they're probably already doing that. So guys, thank you all so much for joining us this week. As always, if you can, we are not asking you to pay for this class. We are not asking you to pay for any of these classes. But if you have it, if you have an extra five bucks, if you have an extra 10 bucks and want to donate to Fort Worth Opera, we would really appreciate it. We can keep this content coming to you all summer long. And you know, everybody needs a little extra cash right now. So if you have the means and can donate to Fort Worth Opera, that would be great and very helpful. Again, we are not asking you to pay for this class, so it is not necessary. But if you can, we would appreciate it. Next week, da -da -da -da, announcement, announcement, we will have conductor Dean Williamson with us for a class completely on the singer-conductor relationship and how to work with a conductor 
in different types of rehearsal situations and on different types of repertoire. So the singers that we're gonna choose for this class are going to be completely different repertoire. We're gonna have some Mozart, some bel canto, some Verdi, some long recitative, some short recitative. So we can really get to know the singer conductor relationship and how to work with that conductor. So next week, Dean Williamson, again, you guys can uh, request to audit. You get the first shot. We will not put this on social media until Monday. So you get the first slot. And as always, the applications for singers are rolling. So we have not chosen our five singers for next week yet. So if you have not sent us an application and would like to, please do. And if you have already sent us an application and we haven't scheduled you yet, you are on a list, I promise you. And we are considering everyone who applied all the way back at the beginning of June for all of the classes through August 1st. So please don't think if, if you haven't been, been scheduled yet that you are not on a list anymore because you are. And we are very, very much looking forward to next Saturday's class as well. So if you'd like to audit or apply, send your email to masterclass at fwopera.org. Ken, thank you so much again for giving us your Saturday afternoon to go Oops. over all of this incredible information. Thank you to Chloe. Julia, Joel, Melina, and Anthony for singing so beautifully today for us. Thank you all, and thank you for bringing your repertoire so we, can dis we could discuss that and really get an idea of what a good competition repertoire list would be for the different voice types. It was super helpful, super informative, and we appreciate you all. Thank you so much. Ryan, I'm going to throw it back to you. I Ken, just yes? I just want to say it's been a total pleasure. Thanks to everybody. And I hope I see and hear you all in person, live. Yes, thank you. Yes, for sure. Live and in person for soon would be soon would be so nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> all right, I'm gonna throw it back to you, Ryan, and we'll see everybody next week. Ken, it was such a joy to have you with us today. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure, Ryan. Thanks yeah. for your hospitality. Of course, of course. I love you, Jen. You know that. I love you so love much. Love you. <laughs> What? Congrats, all you wonderful singers. You were awesome. And thank you, everybody, for taking the time out to be with us today. And I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.